Who's pulling the strings? Who are the traffickers, the organized crime, the gangs that are pulling the strings and really getting all of the profit while they use this young person as in modern day slavery to be used for profit? $810 million in San Diego County alone. Welcome to Crime News Insider. This is Jorge Del Portillo. And with me, as always, is Lori Hoff. How are you doing, Lori? I'm doing well, Jorge. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Uh, Today, we're going to introduce our audience. Um, A lot of our audience is in San Diego, but a lot of them are not. And you should know that, you know, San Diego County is the fifth most populous county in the United States and the second most populous county in California. And the city of San Diego, by many measures, is one of the safest major cities in the United States. And I like to think it's a large part because of our district attorney's office here. We have the second largest district attorney's office in California, and our office has over a thousand employees. So we have a very special guest today, and with us is our very own district attorney, Summer Steffen. Summer Steffen was the first district attorney in San Diego to rise through the ranks as a prosecutor to become the elected DA. As a trial prosecutor, she tried more than 100 jury trials, including cases of complex homicides, sexually violent predators, child molestation, sexual assaults, school shooting case that we'll talk about and human trafficking related cases. She served as the chief of the DA's North County branch, the chief of the sex crimes and human trafficking division, which is a special victims unit that she pioneered and an area of the law where she's a national leader. She was named a modern day abolitionist uh, for her efforts and received numerous awards. Uh, Summer Stefan has also coordinated efforts to protect the community from targeted mass violence with the school threats task force that implemented a unified protocol with all 42 school districts in San Diego County. She has started the effective veterans court treatment. She has received numerous awards. And in, because of that, in June of 2018, San Diego County voters overwhelmingly elected her as a district attorney. She is a career prosecutor who devoted her life to protecting children and families and providing justice to the most vulnerable. Summer Stefan, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to be with you. It's, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, can you uh, tell our audience what made you want to be a prosecutor? You know, it's a, it's a long story that I'll, I'll shorten. I'll speed through it. But it started for me when I was 12 years old and I was an avid reader and um, a little bit of a nerd And I was reading the National Geographic magazine and saw an article in there uh, that had, and you know, the National Geographic has the most amazing pictures that really speak to you uh, and touch your heart. And there was a photo of some girls that looked like they were my age in North Africa, a region called Sukhatra. Um, And um, these girls looked, um, just by looking at the photo, they looked like they didn't have hope, that they, they were fearful. They had this this look of fear in their eyes. And and when you read the story, you see that they were caught up in a situation where they were being abused and, you know, used. And at that moment, I just related to that photo and thought I wanted to do something with my life where I reduce or take away that look of fear and of hopelessness. And I wanted, I, that's what I ended up doing, devoting the rest of my life to a, to a career that, that brings safety, that makes people feel that they're protected, that there is a justice that they can rely on. And uh, so I've spent 31 years now, more than uh, longer than I've been alive, not doing this as a prosecutor. Oh, more, more than half your life has been uh, this job. Uh, What would you say if someone were to ask you, what is the best part of your job? You know, the best part remains where I started, which is being able to meet victims in their very worst time when their loved one has been ripped out of their life uh, due to violence. Meet victims that have been, you know, raped, abused, traumatized, shot at and 
be able to let them know in that moment that you are going to do something about it. You're going to bring justice. You're you're going to fight for them. And, you know, and in our business, as you know, we don't give guarantees, but we guarantee that we will treat them like family members and we will do our very best to, to pursue uh, a feeling of safety and justice for them. That still remains. And as DA, I still meet with victims' families. I met with a family like that just yesterday. It is a regular part of my life as the elected district attorney because I want to stay close to the roots of what it means to be an ethical, um, modern-day prosecutor's office. I remember summer starting in in Vista back in 2009, and you, you even were talking then about you know, the fact that we need to treat our victims like we treat our own family members. And I, I think it's awesome that as DA, that is one of the ethoses that you now bring to our entire office. Can you talk a little bit about the, the Kelly school shooting? That was something that you did uh, while you were chief of VISTA and doing dual roles, both in management and taking on one of the the largest cases at that time in San Diego. And how was that for you? You know, still remains when you when you uh, hear about a school shooting, it is it's it's a different kind of case because, you know, that in addition to the actual victims that are harmed, that there is such a large ripple effect and that it's it's touching everybody from the teachers, the staff, the parents, and then the community at large, because schools are supposed to be the place you send your kids and they're safe. And when that is basically turned upside down, uh, that has such a huge impact on the community. So yes, I was the chief of the North County branch and on a Friday as usual when really bad things happen and the school shooting happened. And I responded right away to the Carlsbad Police Department. And my goal was to kind of begin to assist them to to put the pieces together. We realized right away that it was going to be uh, potentially a mental health issue, as we see in a lot of our school shootings. We wanted to make sure the investigation was impeccable, that we provided resources. I started to assemble our victim services team to provide crisis care for this community. This was an elementary school. Uh, the shooter had selected a time where the maximum number of kids were on the playground that day. And you're talking about, you know, five to eight year olds on the playground. And so the community was just uh, in terror. But, you know, once I walked in and began to touch the case, there was there was just absolutely no way I could not stay with it throughout. So I assigned it to myself and uh, I continued with that case. And it took two years. One thing that we did is I realized that the kids had to feel comfortable in the courtroom. They were key witnesses. These were very young kids. So we brought dog therapy, you know, our therapy dogs that are amazing to support them. But I also would go on uh, Fridays and I would just have pizza in the courtyard with them. We wouldn't talk about the case, but they felt so comfortable with me as a regular fixture that um, when they came into the courtroom and had to testify at the end, uh, one of the kiddos, I asked them, you know, what is the most important thing in the courtroom? And their answer was, you know, I'm in charge. I have the wheel, you know, kind of I'm in the driver's seat. And of course they weren't driving, but it's because, you know, we were trying to empower them that they're in charge in that courtroom. And that's what they said. So I said, okay, well then what's the second most important (laughs) thing? And they said, um, to tell the truth, because it uh-huh. that's always the most important thing, but um, to kind of how the brains of kids work. At the end of the day, we were able to bring justice, you know, put away the shooter for 77 years, bring the trauma services and care. We did something really new. We 
forensically interviewed the peripheral witnesses along with the witnesses that were harmed. Miraculously, the two girls that were shot survived, even though they were shot at close range and life lighted. And one of the, the girls just graduated from high school and is, wow. is interested in pursuing a career as a prosecutor, potentially. Wow. And I am I am so thrilled about that. But I think, you know, a more lasting impact and really the the why the role of the district attorney is so important Doing the the on-the-ground work is critical, but being the district attorney helps you to also set policy. And it was important to me that while we could bring this justice, and it was very, very meaningful, what if we could prevent the shooting in the first place? What if we could create a system where the red flags are detected early? And we know that, especially in school shootings, the shooter often tells at least one person, if not two, about their plan. And this was the same in my shooting. The shooter had told people, but it wasn't reported. And so we came together and it was a priority for me when I became the DA to create a protocol that all 43 school districts signed on to, to detect early with law enforcement. And yesterday, in fact, we upgraded our protocol so that it meets the moment and that the research is not stale. And we brought the U.S. Secret Service and their national uh, violence prevention center to give us the absolute latest information on how we keep our kids and our schools safe. And we upgraded our protocol to meet the moment. This has become a national standard. We get calls every day about our protocol, how we're doing it, how we're tracking these threats and responding to them in real time. It's, it's so important. And the way that, that you took the, the Kelly School shooting case as an example and then broadening it to, to really solving a big, important issue is something that I've noticed that you have done a lot in a lot of areas. For example, you, you know, human trafficking was always close to your heart and you, you worked on those cases, but then you transitioned and you went on to find solutions to prevent human trafficking and same with the opioid crisis and same with the the family justice center can you talk about those you know taking those ideas and then how do how do we broadly work as a society to to impact and actually create solutions and change and and that's exactly right and as you know Jorge and Lori we work together as an office on our new mission you know when I came into office and Our mission spells out, and it's very unique in the nation, our mission is to ethically prosecute crime and to protect our victims, which we spelled out, but also to prevent harm where we are able to, because we felt that we are experts on the ethical prosecution and we're experts on protecting our victims. But we are really natural, organic experts because of our experiences on uh, how do we prevent that from happening in the first place. So just like in the school shooting with human trafficking, you know, we we formed a, a human trafficking division. We pushed for laws to to improve the laws in human trafficking. We formed a national best standards human trafficking task force. So our prosecution, our investigation, our ability to recover victims is second to none. But that means they are already victims. That means the harm to our children and our young adults and our older adults has already happened. So we wanted to put together a way to prevent in the first place. And so what we what we did is we came together with our community. You know, we we really collaborate well. We listen. Listening is such a valuable tool to, to bring in those expert voices, the medical voices, the expertise. And we created, we supported a prevention education program. And we also fought to pass laws that make it mandatory to have education about prevention in the schools about human trafficking because 
human trafficking is not happening elsewhere. It's in our backyard. It's global and it's local. It affects many more victims than is the second largest criminal industry in the United States oh. and in San Diego. And after drug dealing, the selling of human beings for sex or labor is the criminal industry that thrives unless we come in and stop it. And so this prevention program is launching big in the schools. It's a first private public partnership between the DA's office, the Office of Education, and the community and philanthropy to fund it so that because what I didn't want is I was getting calls from schools that can afford to fund it. Right. Um, right. And it wasn't right for me and our office, the way we operate, because we are focused on, on equity and on justice for all, that a kid who needs it the most potentially in a socioeconomically deprived area is the one not getting the prevention. And that's why we wanted to fund every school. And that's what we ended up doing. And it's showing some really great results is to build resilience. So, so that kids aren't just focused on stranger danger, because we know that is at most a 20% of the cases, but the people that pose as friends, as rescuers as modeling agents that are recruiting our kids online. And with that, we are seeing great promise. We're also, we just launched this year, uh, a program where we're educating all of our hotels, motels, our tourism industry, our airports, because we know human trafficking thrives off of moving the victim from one region to another. So so those are some of the things that we put forth. But one place that we continue to focus is how do we, in a trauma-informed way, help our victims escape a life where they don't have dignity, they don't have liberty, they don't have the promise that humanity offers. And by altering the lens of law enforcement so that they are not looking at the victim as the offender. So we changed all of that where our officers first, when they interact with somebody in prostitution, they are assuming this is a victim. And that's a change in mindset for law enforcement, right? Hori, absolutely a shift, a complete shift. And with that, then offering services, having our victim advocates come along. And then on the on the back end, creating the investigations to deep dive and find out who are who's pulling the strings, who are the traffickers, the organized crime, the gangs that are pulling the strings and really getting all of the profit while they use this young person as in modern day slavery to be used for profit. $810 million in San Diego County alone yearly in profit from the sex trafficking industry. And that doesn't account for labor trafficking. And with an average age of 16 years old, with victims as young, a couple of weeks ago, we recovered a 13 year old. Uh, So we have many younger, but to to think that our victims are at an average 16 is, is, is just unconscionable. And we have to end human trafficking. And that's what we, we need to continue to work on. It's such a huge, important project. And you thought so globally about it. One of the other things that you have been working on for a long time and has finally come to fruition is the North County Family Justice Center. Can you talk about the road to opening that and what a what a tremendous service it does for our community? Yeah, the North County Family Justice Center is, has been a dream for me ever since I pioneered the Sex Crimes and Human Trafficking Division. You know, way back in 2005, I realized that we send victims to 20 different places to get services. When crime upends their life, you know, they're going to get a restraining order in one place. They're going to seek another shelter because if they're a domestic violence victim, they've potentially depended on the abuser for income and financial sustenance. They're going to another door to get food. They're going somewhere else to get 
potentially retrained to have a dignified work rather than be used in prostitution because they've lost their innocence, they've lost their childhood. And that that's just not the way to do things. And so we wanted a one-stop place where they walk in and they have what I call hope, healing, and justice all in one place where all of the services are there. They get their trauma, mental health services to recover. They get their medical evaluation. If they're a rape victim, they get their sexual assault exam in one place. They get their domestic violence exam in one place. They get their referral to everything assessed based on their needs. And so this has been a long road to open this, and it is going to open early next year. I'm I'm just so thrilled for our victims. And the buzz in the community is incredible. Everyone is looking forward to it. Remember, our North County region is bigger than most counties. It serves over a million people. Uh, San Diego is the home for family justice centers. They began in San Diego. We have one in downtown San Diego. But because we are so large, accessing those services for victims in the North region has has not worked out. And so they need a place. And I want to add a note um, because we learned from the other family justice centers around the nation. One thing that's been missing from the family justice centers is caring for our elder abuse victims. Hmm. So we wanted this to be a continuum where um, where it serves children, it serves adults, and it serves seniors in their moment of need. So we're going to have uh, an adult protective services and other services specific to seniors right on site as well. And I'm very excited that this this will be no wrong door for anyone. Everyone who walks in will be served and, and get the help they need. It's really a, such a nice holistic approach. And I just love the layout. I've seen the plans and the layout. It's so beautiful. It's so well thought out. It's really, really remarkable. And and for the people that don't live in San Diego County, like Summer said, I mean, it's a far drive from the northern part of San Diego County all the way downtown. So it's very necessary you to don't have this. say Jorge. Jorge. I know. <laughs> we both live in North County and <laughs> it, it's a far drive. Um, so I, I think that's fantastic. You know, dovetailing on, I just want to hand on one thing that you said about elder abuse. I I recently saw that our office has this elder abuse task force. Can you talk about that very briefly? Yes. So the Elder Justice Task Force is the first of its kind in the nation. I know you guys get tired of this, but I'm telling <laughs> you this because, because you are a part of it. You know, this is this is there is no I in this. It it is that we have you know, 320 incredible prosecutors, you know, that that will go to the far ends of the earth to protect someone and to serve justice. It's because we have the most elite 120 peace officers that are the best of the best that we recruit and retain and are victim advocates. So it is the big we that allows all of these first of its kind innovations that we've had. And I am so proud to lead these with the team that we have. But but this idea came from this huge underground criminal fraud that is being perpetrated on our seniors as a really, you know, a perfect target where where the media, social media is being used to gather information about them. For example, in a case we handled, gather information, what are the names of their grandkids? You know, right. do the grandkids live in town? Because you can gather all of that from social media or do, do they live out of town so that you can target that senior and give them a call in what has become extremely prevalent around the nation, the granny scam, mm-hmm. and tell them that their grandchild has now been arrested in Mexico. And if you don't provide this amount of money, they'll spend the rest of their life in that jail. And they have the name. So it sounds legitimate. Completely. They're like they're like Hollywood status actors. Their deception is so, so beneath humanity. It it makes me so angry that someone would 
take someone's life saving that has worked all their life right. and also traumatize their heart. We've had seniors, you know, get palpitations. We've had seniors after being ripped off like this want to commit suicide because they, they don't want to be a burden on their family. This is an outrageous crime. It's mu- it's more than economic fraud. It is it is just against uh, against humanity. So we wanted to figure out who is pulling the strings again, like we tried to figure out in human trafficking. And it, it was Scott Perillo that leads our elder abuse division with Felix Salazar, who's uh, our elder abuse investigator. As you know, we have a specialized elder abuse unit that knows about how to fight these types of crimes on their own, uh, served hundreds of search warrants based on investigative reports that come from around the 12 police agencies and sheriffs we have. And they saw some commonalities. They saw that this is not one-offs. These are connected potentially by criminal syndicates. They took their research to the FBI because we needed the FBI since some of the money was being used out of state And with that came the idea to form the Elder Justice Task Force, which now is the big buzz in Washington, D.C. They're actually coming to town to take a look at it, to see if it can be replicated around the nation. And within months, we were able to bring both a state action to hold those scammers accountable, but also a big central action that took multiple of members of the syndicate down. So this is this is very exciting because we're we're really doing something about this problem in an effective way by thinking outside the box and putting these task forces together. I think that's just a testament to your experience and your leadership. So I, I just want to uh, end on asking you, uh, can you just tell us a, a little bit about your vision for the future of the office or any message that you want to give our audience or the community out there? Well, you know, I think our, our office and we put out a midterm report because one thing that we really believe in is to, to build trust, we want to be transparent with the community. We want to share information. We want them to know the journey we're on because trust, you know, is the way that allows people to call uh, police, to come to court. That That's pivotal to our justice system and to our service. So what we, sh- we demonstrated in our uh, midterm report is that what we're doing is working. And how did we demonstrate that? We demonstrated it by using data, by having intelligence analysts that we brought, I brought on board in the office that through data are able to tell us whether this approach, this modern day prosecutor approach that retains the excellence of the past, but is always moving forward into the future is working. And the results are are pretty incredible for, you know, what we've done is we focused on the highest level ethical prosecution. We've given justice to victims. We've prosecuted that some of the toughest cases, we've expanded our cold case division, getting a half a million dollar grant to make sure that no victim's family is still wondering who did it. And is that person still around to harm someone else? We were able to solve 12 cases using genealogy just in the last uh, couple of years. But we also looked at, you know, are there ways that we can interrupt that school to prison pipeline, that we can recover kids before they become part of our criminal justice system? So we launched a juvenile diversion initiative. We also looked at our young adults who make stupid mistakes in a non-serious, non-violent way, but are trapped with a criminal record of a petty theft or um, in an incident where they're acting criminally, using drugs, experimenting, and we offered a huge diversion program. But the even more important is 
that we measured and we found that while generally when you commit a crime, you're likely to recommit those crimes at a 30%, sometimes up to 50% rate, thus victimizing our community. With our initiatives that are thoughtful, evidence-based, we're able to look at the root causes like veterans treatment court, drug court, root causes of crime, address mental health, address substance abuse, recover that person's life so that they're not uh, acting in a criminal way, which is a win for our community and victims, but a win for the individual and their families. And the recidivism rate that we've measured now over three years is 5%. 5%. There is no recidivism rate like it in the nation. Again, showing that these thoughtful, not one size fits all, looking at serious violent criminals, sexual predators. There is a different way to handle those. We can't allow them to harm our community in that devastating way. But then you have people who make mistakes. They still deserve second chances. And how do we do that in the best way that works for everyone? Really exciting. And, and I think that's that's the best way to put it. Everything that we're, you know, that our office is doing under your leadership is very, it's a very exciting and it's it's big and it's often very new. And we're lucky. I think we're lucky to have you, Summer. And and frankly, I think San Diego is lucky to have you as well. So thank you for being with us today. Well, I feel like the lucky one. Trust me on this. I tell everyone I have the best team that is is literally a dream team assembled. I've even used the term that we are like, you know, Avengers assemble um, the, the, the real life version of that with different kinds of superpowers that come from our heart and mind. I'm, I'm the shortest Avenger uh, on the team. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Summer. If you're still feeling lucky, we have a quiz that we end oh. the show. <laughs> um, we, end each episode on a light note and we look at the laws on the books where two are real one is fake and see if you can guess which law is the fake are you ready i'm ready but i'm terrible at quizzes go ahead (laughs) okay so here we go a in north carolina it's illegal to have a bingo game last more than five hours b in south carolina it's illegal to operate a dance hall within a quarter mile of a church and C, in Severance, Colorado, it's illegal to throw snowballs. Summer, since you're our guest, I will ask you to go first. Tell us your guess. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that it's the um, can't have a dance hall near a church because of the roots of South Carolina and their kind of the whole against dancing. I think there was a movie that I loved uh, Footloose. Uh, Footloose. Footloose, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved about that. So that's my final answer. <laughs> you think that one's the fake? I think that, no, I think that oh. one's the real. Oh, yes. There's, there are two real out of these. Oh, and two real. So which one is the snowballs are also real. Snowballs are also real. Okay, so you think A, it's illegal to have a bingo game last and more. Yes. Um, more than five hours in North Carolina is, is the fake. Okay. Yes. I like it. Footloose based on a, on a true story. Uh, Lori, what do you think? Gosh, I don't know. Jorge, you're getting good at these. I have to say I was onto you at first, but now I, now I, now it's tough. I feel <laughs> like it, the fake has to be illegal to throw snowballs, but I don't know where severance Colorado is, but if it's anywhere near snow, then how can you outlaw that? So I'm going to go with C. All right. C, that means you both agree in South Carolina, it's illegal to operate a dance hall within a quarter mile of a church. And this one is on the books. It is section 52-13-20. It shall be unlawful to operate or maintain an outside the limits of any incorporated town, uh, a dance hall within a quarter mile of a rural church or a rural cemetery. So um, it carries... uh, I forgot what sentence it is. I, I believe it's a it's a misdemeanor. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so good job there. Let's go on to C. In Severance, Colorado, it's illegal to throw snowballs. Lori thinks this is a fake, and Summer thinks this one's real, and this one is the fake. Uh, Sorry, Summer. Uh, However, had we had this quiz in 2019, 
it was illegal in Severance, Colorado to throw snowballs. It really says uh, section 10-5-80, throwing stones or missiles upon any other person is, is unlawful. And they specifically defined a missile to include snowballs. Wow. So, as of 2019. So this yeah, is a recent change. A recent change. There was a child uh, in Colorado that learned about this and petitioned the, the city to change its laws. And he got it done. Oh, interesting. That yeah. makes me feel a little better. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're ever in severance, feel free to throw some snowballs. They're, they're not qualified as missiles. That means A, in North Carolina, it's still illegal to have a bingo game last in more than five hours. You have to have licenses. There's all these uh, regulations. So that one is real. That's section 14-309.8. So four hours and 59 minutes. That's the max. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Summer. It was such an honor to have you on our podcast. We are officially six months in and it's such a pleasure to not only work for you, but also have your leadership here in the community as a community member. It's an honor to serve and alongside you. So thank you so much. It was really fun. Yes. Thank you, Summer. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And until next time, this is the Crime News Insider Podcast. on this podcast are solely of the speakers and do not reflect the views of the Deputy DA's Association nor the District Attorney. Questions and comments can be submitted through our website at sddaa.net. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at San Diego DDAs. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. Done.